thanks for coming and staying to the end of the, the session. It's been a really long and, and eventful conference. So um, it's good to see everyone excited at the end. So um, my name's Adam Steer, and I am going to talk about ex exploiting Pete Al and Antoine in the wild. Um, and hopefully this talk will, is going to work. Um, full screen, come on, oh, that'll do. That's okay, like that. Okay, so um, just like Connor's talk, this is going to be about the, uh, you know, beat our library and entwine working together um, in the wild. And even in Bucharest, you can find PDAL out there. We're just walking around a cafe and, and we found the logo just sitting there. So it's everywhere. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. I, I'm a free, freelance geospatial consultant. I, I run my own little company like a lot of people here. And uh, one of the points of this talk is to sort of show how using the tools that we've got from people like Connor, um, all of the people that just do have, um, you know, small companies or single person companies even can do some pretty amazing stuff. Um, I hope it's pretty amazing anyway. I think it is. So I, I, um, I've been involved in OSGO stuff for a little bit. I was on the organizing committee for the Oceania regional conferences. Um, I have a bunch of OSGO things and I'm pretty bad at actually doing things about it. So sorry about that. We'll, we'll get there. And um, I used to be a field scientist, but since science went crazy with funding stuff, I turned into a data wrangler. So I came from driving these things around um, over this stuff, um, Antarctic sea ice. And I really hope this works. Yes, cool. Um, in order to make um, models like this, which give us data about the sea ice, so this, this we're trying to capture elevation and then figure out how thick the sea ice is underneath that. Um, then turned into a data wrangler. So if you've been coming to Phosphorgees for a little while, you might have seen me talk about this in 2017. Um, I used the point data abstraction library to basically um, work as the infrastructure behind a PyWPS service that gave you point cloud products on demand. So this is a, a, a rasterized hill shade from a, a complex polygon clip from a 1600-kilometer LiDAR, square-kilometer LiDAR data set that um, the government that collected it still doesn't quite know what to do with it. So um, we prototyped that service. Unfortunately, I left that role and the project died. Um, so the, the link on the bottom is really small to read, but you can go on GitHub and find it if you want to, to have a look and play with it. Um, I don't recommend running it in production. So um, that's a little bit about what I've done. So. Um, what do I do now with Pete Allen and Twine? And wh what's happened since then? So basically, use these tools for analysis and processing and data visualization. And I like this little slide. It's a great visualiza visualization of some data. And um, if anyone can guess what data is being vis visualized there, stick your hand up, because not everyone gets it. No, uh, single shot, double shot. So the left hand is, yeah, it's great. It's just made, but um, not a, it's a great example because not everyone gets that. So it's a cool example of how visualization is different for everybody as well. So, um, oh, I should have made that bigger. So for anyone who's watching live or if you're sitting in here with a laptop, you can find the talk there, and some of the slides have an interactive background, and you can play around with them, uh, or you can listen, um, or do both if you want. So the first use of Peter Allen and Twine in the wild, wild that I want to tell you about is hydrography, because normally we think about these tools for looking up above the ground. There's actually quite a big set of use cases for multi-beam sonar and, and, and analyzing um, the numerous data formats that come along with hydrographic surveys. So the first use case is actually, sorry, I'm gonna see if I can make this a bit bigger. No? 
Now I have really big arrows, sorry. Um, okay, I, I should have tested this earlier. But anyway, the, this project has nothing to do with visualizing data or displaying data. It's, it's part of a, um, a quality assurance tool for hydrographic surveys. So this pipeline, this little PDAL pipeline, JSON block, is all about just extracting boundaries from a bunch of um, hydrographic survey points that are scored, stored as ASCII X, Ys, and Zs. And what we want to do is just get a coverage out, like the boundaries that Connor showed in the last talk, and um, compare them with what was surveyed. So this just extracts boundaries from those um, otherwise unwieldy ASCII data formats that hydrographers do not want to get away from. Um, this one here, uh, very similar, is just saying it's a very short PDAL pipeline wrapped up in a Python function. Actually, no, this is a, a Python function that drives a PDAL pi pipeline as a Python library to get the density of these ASCII points. So you feed it uh, a big ASCII file and it comes back and says, um, your points are, you have 10 points per square meter or whatever it is. Um, and that again is just designed for, you know, quality assurance for surveys because a contractor will go out and collect some data and you want to check that they've um, met the specification. So um, really simple tools and because um, Geoscience Australia and Frontier SI were, were happy to open source it, you can go to the link there and um, have a look through a bunch of Python notebooks and um, run all the tests or have a look at how they're built. And um, that, that particular case is just a, a neat way of PDAL turning up somewhere surprising. You, you'd sort of, you know, it, it works well there because you don't have to write all of the readers and writers yourself. You can just plug them in, drive it with Python. It's pretty easy and it works. So um, for me, those are, those are all winning things. And um, you can make interactive notebooks that let people walk through it all. So another much prettier use case for hydrographic surveying is just making maps. So this is um, four billion, no, just over four billion points of uh, multi-beam sonar data over 700,000 square kilometers that was collected when they're searching for a, a lost aircraft off the west coast of Australia. So it's, it's a lot of data to get through and map. And um, this map was made completely in QGIS using uh, PDAL to drive the processing of the um, ASCII hydrographic data into something that could be used to draw this map. So um, here's the first pipeline and it just steps through. So basically the process of, the first process was to, ta to take the ASCII data, um, reproject it into something that sort of worked uh, in one map that size instead of having multiple UTM zones. Um, Add some dimensions so we could say, well, it's ground data and we can give it a color. And then um, clean up any noise, uh, invert the z-axis of the data so that um, so a lot of hydro hydrographic surveys, the, the z value comes out positive and it's like, well, it's not up, it's down. So we just fix that. Um, and then we write it out as LAS files. And that, um, for someone just processing a bunch of data, that works really well because you can throw away these big um, uh, fluffy ASCII files, store it as LAS, save yourself a lot of time and space on disk, or a lot of space on disk at least. But this is, um, basically you can just collect every one of those big ASCII files, run this pipeline once and it's done on all of them. Um, that's more or less all of the magic code that you have to write. And then you can switch to something else like a bash shell and query all of those LAS files, stuff them into a database. So this is another block of PDAL driven by a bash script that um, just queries the metadata for every one of those LAS files and then stuffs the, um, stuffs the data into a PostGIS database. So here, grab all the ASCII from a thread server, which is an interesting exercise in itself. Reproject invert, get the boundaries, stuff it into PostGIS. And we'll make an entwine index for, um, for good measure, which we'll see in a bit, and do stuff like make pretty maps. Um, and here's the result of entwinifying it. So when you're watching this presentation at home, you can play with this data set and you can browse around and have a look at it all. So this is visualized using the Poetry WebGL viewer um, straight from an entwined point tile index. 
Um, and you can see that the RGB colors that I've applied come out, otherwise it would just be looking at black points. And so then you can do other stuff. Once you've got that EPT index, say we wanted to uh, make an elevation model of part of the seafloor. It's just a really simple um, query a box from the EPT and go for it. And then you can dump it back into QGIS and make pretty maps and, and spit them out again. But I'm using more time than I thought, so I'm going to have to go faster. So going back, uh, back up above the ground, we can do similar stuff with landscape style data. So this is a 1,600 square kilometres of the Australian Capital Territory again. This is my favourite toy data set because it's really pretty. Um, so it's colorized within t um, with PDAL and then uh, made into an entwined index and that lets us do stuff like clip buildings out. So we might not be interested in all of it, we just want a building. So this is a two-stage process. First we have to collect points from inside a bounding box and then lower down and clip them by a complex polygon so that I've truncated the, the long line of coordinates at the bottom there. But um, I think it's either current releases of Entwine or upcoming ones, you can just go straight to the complex polygon clip and you don't have to do it in two stages, which is really cool. And then you can just get stuff like this. So this is the National Museum of Australia. Um, it's come straight from that um, 30 billion point data set without having to search three tires. I've just gone, here's the bounding box, get me the data. And on the way, so I've put the, the dimensions up there. Because if you're looking at the Z dimension there, it's, it's the point that I've picked is 13 meters. So on the way between my Entwine index and this little data set, I've converted to the, um, got the building out as height above ground. So I'm looking at building heights rather than absolute elevations. So um, that's all done with, with fairly simple tooling. And here we go. So again, the workflow, colorize, entwineify, do stuff. So it's a lot shorter than what I did with the, um, the hydrographic data. Was, granted, there are less steps because the data was already in a decent format. Um, oh, this one worked great. So this one is another above ground example. This is 8,000 square kilometers of um, river basin. Um, there's not so many buildings to care about there, but if you're looking at it from a scientific point of view, you might be caring about the treeness. So for a given unit, say you're looking at satellite data and going, well, I've got 25 meter satellite pixels, I can do some tree detection and figure out how many trees are in it. Um, we've got this giant LiDAR data set, how can we use that to QA it? Well, now that we have it entwinified, we can use PDAL to grab a little section, run some Python code, I won't show you the Python code because it's pretty long, but basically just does, collects all of the tree classified points in the data, writes out a 2D histogram and gives us back a, a rasterized, uh, a rasterized uh, treeness histogram as a GeoTIFF, um, which looks like this. So it's come out a little bit blurry, but in, in the uh, a coincident aerial photo is the base map there. And on top, um, blue colored areas are very few trees up to brighter yellow, which is nearly fully tree colored. And you can sort of see that the trees follow the river or old river paths. Um, so it's a really neat way of being able to test, check against other things or make these maps from scratch if they don't exist. Um, so this one's set for 10 meter pixels, so you might go, well, that, that kind of matches up with Sentinel-1 or you can do whatever you like. But again, it's pretty easy. Um, colorize, entwineify, do stuff. And it's all those really short units um, using PDAL to drive stuff and entwine as the storage medium. And that's a really easy storage medium to work with. So um, I'm going to go to smaller scales now. So we've gone from 700,000, well, whole continents to sea floors to sort of landscape scales. And now what if you're looking at smaller scales than that? Is Entwine still a useful tool? And um, I, I, I think it is because um, this is a cool project that I had and it's the only picture I can show you of it. But in there is a, a 30 point per meter airborne scan and an the original data set for this building stadium on the lower right was just an ungeo referenced um, terrestrial LIDAR scan. It's about 1.2 billion points, so it's super dense. Like if you do a LAS density, it's like 10,000 points per meter. There's a lot of data there. Um, and our challenge was to, to co-register the two, and we're like, um, what do we do? So in this case, we um, were able to find a few co-registered points and then use 
tools that are all contained in PDAL to find the relationship between those points, apply a transformation, and glue the two data sets together, and then uh, visualize them. So this was part of a sort of stand in a basketball court and then zoom out through the building out to sort of the entire landscape scale project. And um, again, workflow, this is a bit longer. Find co-registration points, uh, generate the matrix, apply it using PDAL. Ah, come on. And try and do stuff. So again, there we could um, clip out bits of the building or do different things if you wanted, if you knew the bounding box and wanted to do stuff. And then everyone wants to talk about these things, so I'm going to talk about them as well. A little remote piloted aircraft, as we call them properly where I come from. Um, this one's really cool. So that, that little aircraft weighs 300 grams. I can launch it from a... Oh, no. It killed. Um, anyway, the point of that one was to show a cliff model that I made with that. And you can see, I don't know how many people are rock climbers, but you can see the ring bolts. You can measure the ring bolts on the cliff. And then because it's viewed in JavaScript as well, you can add more and more stuff to it. But that's beyond the scope of this talk, I think. But um, this one's a, a real use case. So going back to um, our ACT LIDAR, our Australian Capital Territory LIDAR data set, we had a case where we wanted to test um, change detection. So the, the upper data set there is flown with the RPA. Um, took about six minutes to fly it, collected a bunch of photos, processed it, um, and we didn't have ground control points. So it's like, well, we'll use the whatever GPS comes with the drone. And then, then we have the challenge of, well, how do we know where it is? Does it match up with anything else? So we were able to um, use the point data abstraction library to uh, classify ground in the, the RPA data use an iterative closest point matcher with ground class points from the uh, fully geodetically controlled LiDAR data set, match the two, and then generate a, a sort of a, a difference model. So here, um, in the top model, that's colored by difference. So blue is not very different, yellow is very different. And this is, um, the LiDAR data was flown in 2015, the RPA data was collected in 2018, and you can see a building's been built, and a little bit of ground's been moved around, around it as well. So. Um, that was a great little use case for those capacities. And again, classify the ground, generate transforms, apply the transformation, and twinify, do stuff. Um, and um, I think that's, that's all the stuff I had to say. Oh, no more. Yep. That's the technical part of the talk. And now the second part of the talk that I promised is how... Um, Having these communities that build this stuff and all work together to support it, let people like me, who's just one person, do these things that you can play around with many thousands of kilometers worth of LiDAR data and, and um, make all these magical things happen and just pop them out in thin air and go, well, it's done now. So I know a number of big companies in Australia are still struggling. They're, they're sort of shipping multiple terabytes of, of hard drives around when they need to analyze LiDAR data. And, I keep talking to them and say, well, we can just do this, and um, one day it'll start working. But um, the, the basic practice in, in my little enterprise, I guess, is being open by default. So, um, and that's because all of this stuff that I use happens because of passionate people. So I, I want to pick up that model and use it. So when I um, do stuff or write, write about things on my blog, the whole recipe is there. There's, there's nothing held back. There's, it doesn't help my business to, to keep things private because I want to be in the, the business of making cool stuff happen, not the business of protecting IP, right? This, I, if I was a lawyer, I might think differently, but I don't because I'm one guy and there's lots of smart people. And I am standing on the shoulders of giants. Like, um, none of this cap... I, I wouldn't be able to do any of this if it wasn't for the people that are here. And also the organization that supports it. So um, I'm relatively new to OSGO, like even though I've been using open source GIS, GIS things for decades, I think like f four years ago, I was like, oh, what's OSGO? I should go check that out and come to a phosphor G. And that was the first time I ever did. Um, so it's like, it's there and it's worth, worth getting involved in. But um, it works as long as we contribute. But I don't know how to write C++. I can hack around in Python and Bash and stuff. But I can't make commits to make Entwine better or PDAL better or anything. Like, I struggle with JavaScript. All my visualizers are just like really janky 
um, throwing together JavaScript. And that's, that's my programming ability. So what can I do? Um, we can support the people that do know all this stuff. And that's by, by coming here. And um, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to go through. And supporting things like this, so getting involved in running and growing the community that we, that we depend on. Um, and that's it. Thank you for coming. And just one more thing, um, the link at the bottom of the page, there are sort of long form reads of all of the stuff that I've shown there. You can go and look at it all and, and take it and do what you need. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you. Yep. Do you have some experience of using PDAL for object detection inside the clouds? For example, poles. Um, no, I don't yet. It's uh, it's been on my list of things to do, but um, it, it's highly dependent on being funded to do it these days. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Adam, for the for the talk. I have a question which is mainly involves both to you or to Connor. Uh, I was curious when the amount of points is really exploding and you're storing it to 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 some buckets on Amazon uh, or on your own hard disk. Um, Connor already mentioned it goes from seconds to minutes to to query if you want specific points. Is there a strategy or any noticeable difference if you spread your points over different resources or? Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so one thing that I've been meaning to test, and I haven't, and I maybe Connor's done it, is one of the, the valuable things about the EPT structure is that you know I've been sending out these little B boxes, um, bounding boxes. You could just split your query across multiple bounding boxes, and um, as long as you weren't getting the edge points twice, you you could send your query out across multiple processes or scale it out as across as many processes as you liked rather than having one process chugging down lots and lots of points. Does that, does that sort of answer your question? Or? Yeah, I, I was also curious whether it matters whether you disperse your points over multiple resources instead of multiple hard disks, uh, multiple buckets. So. Uh, that's probably a kind of question. That's, that's low le lower level library than I know about. So, yeah. I don't, I don't think it would help all that much. Uh, maybe if you were trying to build like a full globe's worth, maybe you'd get a little bit of benefit. I should have clarified though, when I, that when I was talking about the timings in mine, that was timing for downloading all the data and running all the, running all the algorithmic stuff on the client. So the query itself is quite fast and it's only a few files, a few megabytes, but I'm, on, I'm, I'm reaching out from Iowa City to S3 somewhere, downloading it all, and the actual Poodle pipeline stuff was running on my laptop. So that's where that time comes from. All right, so it's totally scalable in that sense. Cool. Um, any more questions? I thought this was a question. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, thanks, everyone, and um, enjoy the.